afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining Foley today for blockchain and tackling NFTs in sports and entertainment. Before we get started, we would like to go over a few housekeeping items. Questions can be entered via the Q&A widget open on the left-hand side of your screen. We will plan to answer all questions post-program via email. If you experience technical difficulties during the program, please visit the webcast help guide by clicking on the help button below the presentation window, which is designated with a question mark icon. And now I will turn it over to John Israel, co-chair of Foley Sports and Entertainment Group. John, over to you. Thanks so much, Jenny. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. Um, for those that don't know me, I am John Israel. I'm a partner in Foley and Lardner's New York City office, one of 21 Foley offices across the U.S., 24 globally. Uh, we have about 1,200 attorneys practicing in a broad range of disciplines that you would expect to find in a general service law firm of that size like ours. And I am co-chair of the firm Sports and Entertainment Group, which is a multidisciplinary team of attorneys with significant experience in the sports and entertainment industry, with several of us having spent time as in-house in counsel uh, at various professional organizations and entertainment companies. We like to say that as outside lawyers, our group brings a unique insider's perspective to the work we do for clients in the space. Now, uh, in that vein, I spent about eight years as an in-house lawyer at the NBA and have been watching with great interest uh, the growth and publicity around NBA Top Shot, the blockchain-based platform launched last year that allows fans to buy, sell, and trade limited edition NBA licensed video moments as NFTs. Uh, and as we've seen, several NBA teams have followed suit with their own notable NFT drops, including the Charlotte Hornets. And we are lucky to have the team's general counsel, Tamara Daniels, here to give us some insights on that experience today. But of course, NFTs are not limited just to sports memorabilia and can be used to sell and trade unique and tangible and tangible items, including virtual sneakers, digital art and music, and possibilities do seem limitless. Um, and it seems no matter how and in what ways NFTs involve, they are gaining traction as serious money and, and, and investment are flooding the space. And, uh, and as business grows, so does its legal issues, generally, both in number and magnitude. Uh, and indeed, growth um, in business is often a leading indicator of greater legal complications. So as we began working on NFT-related projects, it became clear to our group um, that we we're addressing a range of legal, uh, legal and business matters involving NFTs, some novel, some not so novel, um, that cut across a significant cross-section of legal disciplines from technology and data privacy to patents and platforms, crypto and blockchain, smart contracts and investment transactions, property rights and ownership, trademark and copyright, securities regulations, the list seems to be endless. Um, there really is a plethora of diverse legal risks that lurk out there and they can be tricky um, as the nascent aspects of NFTs and the related technology don't always neatly fit into longstanding legal principles and rules. And in this space, they, those rules often seem suddenly antiquated. But fortunately at Foley, we have the breadth of experience and expertise to cover those range of issues, which really prompted a group of us here to establish what we are calling now our uh, NFT task force. And we really are a virtual one-stop shop for NFT-related legal needs. This group meets regularly. We support one another in ongoing projects and work. We're analyzing the latest developments, publishing thought pieces, and doing podcasts, and, and really developing a uh, growing and expansive list of representative experience in the NFT space. 
all of that activity and information you can find um, on our webpage, the NFT Task Force webpage at Foley.com. And I, I think maybe we're going to throw up a link to that, that webpage so you can, you can take a look at that um, at your leisure. Um, the program today was hatched by that same NFT Task Force, and it was inspired in part by the virtual program on NFTs that we did back in May which provided a general overview on NFTs and also featured some insights from a, a great group of guests in the, who are working in the space. And we got some really good feedback after that program. And actually, it included many requests that we actually dial up the legal a bit. And honestly, it's not often that you find an audience, which wasn't just lawyers, asking for more legal discussion. But I, you know, I guess it kind of makes sense here uh, because the landscape is so fresh and so much is new with NFTs and, and, and working with them and analyzing them. People are just wondering what the legals, legal issues might be that are implicated and, and how they might be addressed. So this time around, as we focus our attention on sports uh, and entertainment, we're going with a slightly different format. First, we're going to hear from several of my Foley colleagues who are going to review in more detail uh, the NFT-related issues and recent developments that are out there, including, for example, the security case against Dapper Labs and the lawsuit involving Jay-Z, Damon Dash, and Rockefeller Records. After that presentation, we're going to hear from our special guests, the aforementioned Tamara Daniels from the Charlotte Hornets and A.J. Vaynerchuk, who is a principal in various self-titled businesses, including Vayner Sports, a full-service ath athlete representation firm. Uh, and with our pairing of AJ and Tamara, we're going to get a sports industry's perspective view from, I guess, the team side and the athlete side of things when it comes to NFTs. So there's lots to cover. Uh, I'm going to step aside and turn it over to my Foley colleagues for our legal review. So thank you again for joining us. And now over to my colleagues in Silicon Valley, Louis Liho and Natasha Allen. Thanks, John. You got Louis Lowe here, and uh, thanks for the, for the introduction and, and the nice words. Um, I'm a, a, a newbie here at Foley and Lardner, and, and just delighted to be able to participate in this uh, in this team that John's put together. And thanks to all the folks out in the audience who have uh, taken away an hour out of their day to to join us and and talk to us about this um, this topic that we are all so passionate about, um, which uh, which is NFTs. And you know, one of the reasons that uh, I'm drawn to it is that it has uh, so many disciplines of law that. That get picked up, as uh, not to mention business. And I, I thought that as we as we begin, it would be helpful to kind of set the stage for um, you know what is driving, in, in my eyes, the the interest in NFTs out in the marketplace. And um, uh, but before I do that, maybe Natasha, you might want to say a few words. Yes, uh, absolutely. So hello, everyone. Uh, as John mentioned, my name is Natasha Allen. I'm uh, one of the partners in the Silicon Valley office, similar to Louis, thank you for spending your time with us. We're uh, ready and looking very excited to delve into all things that are NFT. Um, but Louis, I'll let you go from there. Um, well, thanks, Natasha. Uh, really, we, we all started uh, sitting at home and figuring out what to do with our with our time, how to get our work done, uh, how to address the, the new world as we were seeing it uh, a year and some ago, um, as we know. And um, sometime around May, we saw the price of digital assets really start to spike, May of 2020. Um, we saw uh, not only Elon Musk uh, express a lot of interest in, in, uh, in Bitcoin and various other um, cryptocurrencies, but he also put his money where his mouth was and, and had Tesla invest a billion dollars uh, into into digital assets and specifically Bitcoin. Now, recently uh, he's he's uh, he's turned away from it, but that has not dampened enthusiasm for the sector. Although it has put a, a downward pressure on on the price of Bitcoin, and as we speak, I think the the price is hovering around the thirty six thousand dollar mark, uh, which is still a heck 
a lot more than zero. Um, but uh, we, we saw that at the same time that there was a hunger for, for digital assets, you had a, a category of, of content creators out in the universe that really were prevented from monetizing that. You had uh, basketball teams, uh, uh, football teams, and, and, and sports and entertainment folks no longer able to, to do games or, or live events. And, and so st stuck with that um, reality, you know, what, 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 how could they monetize what they were doing? And of course, there was still a huge hunger among uh, spectators to, to stay in touch with performers and, and sports and entertainment uh, players. And, and so the NFT was born, uh, the non-fungible token. And um, Natasha, you know, we, we, uh, we struggled four years ago with the uh, initial adoption of these coin offerings as to whether a digital asset was a security. And what, what in your mind has changed since then? And, and what do you think is it makes a security today? Uh, so I think that it's still speculative, right? Nothing is settled. The law is still all over the map. Um, I think uh, what will be happening is uh, a lot of factual assessments, right? So the token itself may not be a security, but what you do with it and the action that you take with it may be a security. So we had alluded to the Dapper case, and that's an interesting kind of lawsuit that was filed in New York just in May. Um, and it's, it's packing, or I say assessing what secondary markets, so NFT secondary markets look like, and whether the application of what is called the Howey test could apply. And so that is dealing with, is there um, some type of profit that is being um, uh, obtained by somebody else's efforts? So I think it, it'll be interesting to see kind of what happens with that case. Right now, as I said, you know, there's nothing out there stating that uh, NFT is a security, but it really is an assessment. Um, thanks for that. And I personally think that uh, there, that is an open and shut case, and there is no way that uh, those NBA top shots are, are in fact securities. And I think uh, they absolutely passed the Howey test, but that's, that's just me. Um, you know, <laughs> one of the, the, the interesting developments that, that's happened this year is We've seen venture capital firms not only and hedge funds not only put money into digital assets, but they've poured seventeen billion dollars into companies that are operating in the space, according to PitchBook, and that's more than any single year. And in fact, it's more than all recent years combined. And we're not even halfway done uh, with the year. Um, we saw our friends at Andreessen Horowitz up the road here in Silicon Valley raise a two billion dollar uh, crypto fund, and very interestingly. They hired my old boss, Bill Hinman, uh, who is the outgoing uh, chairman of the Division of Corporate Finance at the SEC, to be an advisor. And, you know, I think that Bill did a, a tremendous uh, service to the industry in, in a number of public statements helping clarify what is and what is not a security. And I think that um, his uh, great influence and prestige uh, in the area and his association with A16 Crypto is going to really help um, further develop the uh, the sector um, but but nonetheless um, you know we're, we're, we're still a little bit unsettled um, as to you know what what the the new Securities and Exchange Commission uh, will will have to say about it and and I don't see anything in the near term that will give us any definition although there is this case in in New York State Court um, if it's still in state court I'm, I'm not sure if it's been removed to federal court in any case um, Natasha, you know, besides the securities laws, what are the other uh, areas of law that that we immediately hone in on when we look at an NFT business model? Um, so just to go back to the Dapper case, I agree that it may be a shut and closed, open and closed case, but I think it really is going to maybe have uh, open the door for other people to put forward you know, similar cases or feel like they have the opportunity to do so. But in terms of, you know, other things that people will be looking at in terms of the application of regulations to NFTs, uh, you have the Commodity Trading Commission, um, uh, which is, is very broad and, and might actually apply to NFTs. Uh, you have the um, anti-laundering, which is another uh, organization. I know that FINRA was recently delving into what NFTs were and how they apply. Um, uh, in terms of, you know, the application of FINRA to those, to NFTs themselves. Um, you have different state and local 
organizations that are haven't really delved into dealing with NFT specifically, more so cryptocurrencies, but uh, they are also taking a second look at, at what the implications are of NFTs, how should they be categorized, and um, how should they be, you know, uh, regulated. Um, and also throwing in the mix is the IRS is also trying to figure out, you know, how do we uh, deal with NFTs and any type of, you know, revenue or monetization that may occur with respect to NFTs. And um, for everyone who's listening, I think the IRS looks at all of this as property. And uh, if you buy property and it increases in value, you have gain. And whether or not that's, that's tax the capital gains rate or ordinary income rates or short-term capital or long-term capital gains rates is all subject to uh, heavy debate uh, in Washington, D.C. this summer. Uh, I hear the Senate's not even going to go into recess. There's so much uh, going on. Um, you know, there's one area that really, um, you know, I find is is challenging with these NFT business models that I see, Natasha, and that's the application of money transmitter rules as whether or not it's a security. Certainly, um, if you are uh, processing the uh, uh, payments, whether in fiat currency or Bitcoin into an NFT and then distributing the proceeds uh, of that sale to the various um, folks on the food chain that that get a slice of 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 those payments, um, you know, there's a there there is a lot of transmission of funds going on, and and in the United States we have federal money transmitter laws, and then we have um, registration laws in 50 states, and, and even in the city of New York, we it has its own uh, registration there for for money transmitters. So it's absolutely an area to to watch out for. And what what I'm finding is that when I see new companies with NFT business models, is that one of the things we need to do is not only identify the legal issues, but help find for them the right business partners to accomplish their goals. And sometimes that's finding uh, an already registered money transmitter so that you don't have to go through the hassle of, of registration federally or in, in, in various different states. And, you know, we haven't even talked about the fact that, you know, there's a there's a whole wide world out there uh, of other countries and, and their rules and, and regulations. And so. Um, partnering with a larger entity that has experience in money transmission um, is certainly um, a viable uh, alternative. Um, but you know, I, I, before we before we segment off to our, our our next colleagues, you know, I just I thought Natasha would be helpful for us to just say a word about the various business partners that that really need to be involved in the creation of an NFT. And obviously, first and foremost, you have. Uh, those um, uh, creators of content, whether it's uh, sports uh, players or franchises, whether it's, uh, it's musicians or, or artists uh, of any kind, um, you've, you've got to secure the content. And, and as we know, um, many of, of, uh, of this, a lot of, a lot of the content has already been monetized in some other fashion. So for example, a, a musician may have already sold their library of, of, uh, of songs to uh, a record label, and and yet they still have retained some rights. Um, and so, uh, if they're to receive a payment in respect of the sale of an NFT regarding their their music, whether it's a clip or an album cover or whatever, uh, you know, do they have to share those payments with their record label? And and most likely, you know, there's there's a lot of analysis that's going to go into that. Um, then there's mm -hmm. going to be you know the the commercial agreement that's going to exist between the creator of the content the creator of the smart contract the, who's going to mint the token. Uh, then there is, of course, uh, the marketplace where the token gets listed. And, and then there are the money transmitters and various vendors that perform tasks along the, the food chain. And you know, with that, Natasha, I think we've got a great lineup of folks to, to address those issues. And, and I'm going to turn That's it back okay. to you. Yeah, absolutely. I agree with you, Louis. I think that, um, as John had mentioned before, we have great expertise at Foley in terms of addressing all of those aspects of an NFT. Um, next up, though, will be Andy Lee, and he will be talking about um, uh, smart contracts. So we will end here. And Andy, on to you. Uh, thanks, Natasha and Louis. Um, <clears throat> appreciate that. Uh, my name is Andy Lee. I am uh, here in Foley's New York office, and I'm a member of the uh, sports and entertainment group, uh, along with John Israel. Uh, so we do a lot of work in the sports and entertainment 
space generally, uh, but I also have a, a te technology practice and I'm a member of the NFT task force uh, that we've formed here at Foley. Uh, and we've been spending a lot of time working on these issues uh, for our clients uh, on specific projects and also getting up to speed on things um, for to, to be prepared for what's coming um, down the pike. So um, I'm going to talk about smart contracts for a, a few minutes, which uh, are basically what powers NFTs on blockchain. Um, the most notable blockchain example of that being uh, Ethereum. We all think about uh, uh, Bitcoin um, on the blockchain, which traditionally Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies um, are developed as a technology with the limited purpose of just executing transactions. But um, as blockchain expanded uh, and, and evolved, Ethereum, for example, came up with uh, a new, uh, well, it was in, in conjunction with Ethereum, a new smart contract programming language called Solidity. There are others as well, but which allows the smart contract to include self-executing rules for the future beyond the initial transaction, just the exchange of money. And that's what gives rise to this notion of smart contracts that I think really opens a lot of possibilities for NFTs to move into uh, interesting applications and areas more than just uh, collectibles and moments and things like that. So I want to talk a little bit about what the smart contract is and, and how it operates. But before I, I get to that, I thought it would be a good idea to actually um, uh, show you an example. Uh, so I had uh, basically gone, uh, I went and created an NFT, um, which I'm putting up on screen here. Hopefully everyone can see it. Um, uh, this is based on a painting that, that my wife had done. We created an image of it, animated it, minted an NFT on uh, Ethereum. And this is what the, the listing page looks like. Uh, you see the NFT there. There's a place on the page where you can uh, click on the contract ID to actually see what the contract itself looks like. So if you were to do that, um, you get essentially a version of this. This is the, the actual computer code embodying the smart contract. Actually, this is only about a third of it. That's all I could fit on this page. Um, so Ethereum uh, and the, the, the various sites that, that operate this gives you the ability to, to see that code and also to use what's called a decompiler. So you can translate that into human readable form, which I'll show you an example of here. We're scrolling through the actual code Click on the decompiler, and you have a version of you know most of this is you know there's a lot of English <laughs> words in here, but still as you go down, I'm scrolling through it. There's about 1,500 lines of of programming code that is not really understandable or decipherable in the way that we we typically think of for a uh, for a contract uh, that that we that a business person or a lawyer might think of in, in a contract. So the the smart contract itself is uh, uh, essentially, well, a guy named Nick Sabo coined the phrase back in 1996, and he said a smart contract is a set of promises specified in digital form, including protocols within which the parties perform on those promises. And an example Sabo gave of how to think about a smart contract is he compared it to a vending machine. So if you think about the logic of a vending machine, is basically money plus snack selection equals snack dispensed. What it's done is it's it's done away with the need for a vendor employee to be there to take your money and give you your snack. Um, Ethereum has this that example on one of their uh, sort of FAQ pages, and then they take that one line of logic, money plus snack selection equals snack dispensed, and they basically write it as a smart contract, and it takes about 30 lines of computer code that doesn't really make much sense to anyone from an English perspective. So the, the point being, yes, we have these smart contracts. We do expect them to uh, evolve into other areas uh, and, and be a part of the technology and different types of transactions going forward. But how are we going to deal with, with issues that inevitably come up? Uh, on, on the one hand, a, a smart contract, because it's computer code, there's a, there's you know a guaranteed input and a guaranteed output. Um, there shouldn't be much need for uh, interpretation, but you know, in reality, we know that disputes over contract interpretation basically are as old as the law itself, um, and that's really what led to the modern notion under the law of seeking out the objective intention of the parties 
based on the plain language of the four corners of the contract. So as I just showed you, the four corners of the, of the contract here uh, are not really you know, legible. How would a judge look at this? I mean, we can see the corners of this box of code here, but there's, uh, there's not an easy way to understand what it actually means. Um, and, uh, and then, so, so, so how, how would a judge deal with that? Uh, presumably, there would be experts who would come in and talk about uh, what the smart contract, in the event of a, of a dispute, what it said and what it meant and, and how it operated. Um, in many ways, like an expert might have to come into a contract dispute and give testimony about uh, what certain terms or phrases mean based on industry custom and usage. Uh, uh, so there are, and, and even though, even though the, the contract itself in the, in the execution of its instructions really shouldn't be able to make a mistake, there, there could be there could be coding errors. There could be things that can that come up. I saw uh, a, an interesting example in uh, the United Kingdom's law commission recently commissioned a call for evidence about smart contracts. So here's an example of a government looking into ways to uh, build out this concept in its legal system. And I think that's that's part of what we're going to see happen here with smart contracts. But that document has an interesting example in which it says basically. Um, uh, imagine this example. Uh, the instructions are to go to the store and buy a newspaper. If there are eggs, get a dozen, right? And the paper points out that a human being would get would get eggs, right? Would probably come back with a dozen with a dozen eggs if there are eggs there. But go to the store and buy a newspaper. If there are eggs, get a dozen. If you converted that into computer programming logic, the computer might read it as get a dozen newspapers, not a dozen eggs. So. Um, you have examples like that where the the, the code might not uh, reflect the actual intention of the parties. Um, there may also be issues in terms of contract disputes where the the code is the, the contract itself is supplemented by other terms. For example, in this NFT on this NFT page, there could be if, if we were able to scroll down, there are descriptions of the product, or there might be descriptions of of what the NFT is, or what you're getting, or certain off chain benefits and how do you deal with inconsistent terms where you might have a conflict between that description and what the smart contract uh, actually says or deploys? Of course, the party uh, viewing something like this uh, has no way in the moment of deciphering what the smart contract actually says. So they're going to rely on what the, the collateral material says. Um, uh, you might also have instances where a smart contract uh, incorporates uh, actual natural language terms, like like much in the way that a, a master services agreement might attach uh, terms and conditions. So it could include some sort of a reference to an external uh, PDF or actual natural language document that is external to the smart contract itself and lives on a secure server or someplace else on the, in on the internet, which in itself sort of raises the question of, uh, is that a vulnerability in the immutability of, of this smart contract. Um, and of course, you also have to deal with the fact that there can be coding errors, there can be mistakes. Um, back in 2016, uh, there was a, a hack of the Ethereum system where someone made off with $50 million worth of Ethereum based on um, uh, a vulnerability that was overlooked in many smart contracts. So we all think of the blockchain as being irreversible and, and immutable is the big word. But what happened then was the Ethereum community basically put together a vote. Some small percentage of of uh, Ethereum holders or, or node keepers um, uh, of, of the, the Ethereum community voted to do what was called a hard fork. And they they reversed everything. They started a new blockchain, almost like I thought about in Back to the Future Part 2, where they talk about an alternate reality where time breaks off. So they went back to the block on the blockchain just before the hack and created a new Ethereum blockchain, leaving the old one as classic Ethereum. So they were able to to undo that. Um, just like with the, the law commission example I gave, uh, the call for evidence from uh, the United Kingdom, where I, I believe we're going to see instances and there isn't much yet there's there's very little uh there are no there as far as i can tell and have found there are no judicial opinions out there uh tackling these issues 
yeah, the specific, specifically the interpretation of smart contracts. There are very few references to smart contracts at all, and most of them are in the context of cases about whether a particular cryptocurrency qualifies as uh, a security, along the lines we were discussing uh, or hearing uh, about earlier from Louis. Um, but as these contracts start getting to be deployed in more transactional ways that expand beyond the scope of merely ownership of a particular piece of property, I believe we will see these cases come into the courts uh, and they will end up getting uh, interpreted and a body of law will develop both through judicial interpretation and through legislation. So if we think about back in the 80s when there was litigation over shrink wrap licenses, uh, which became litigation over click wrap licenses in the 90s and the, and the 2000s. Uh, and then we had the development of electronic signatures and all of the, the, the litigation and, 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 litig and legislation that has now made that uh, a normal part of our lives where you know everyone on this call, I'm sure, has used DocuSign or Adobe Sign or, or just emails back and forth to, to uh, do what in the past would have had to been done in, in, physical, uh, in physical writing. So, um, I think that we're going to see an evolution of the law applicable to uh, the, the enforceability and interpretation of smart contracts in similar ways. In fact, many states already have laws uh, proposed um, to, to try to deal with. New York is, is one of them. Um, not too long ago, Assembly Bill A3760 was introduced. It's now, it's now in committee, but um, it is an amendment of the technology law that specifically defines blockchain technology and smart contracts um, and makes it clear that signatures affected through blockchain technology or smart contracts qualify as electronic records for purposes of, of electronic signatures. Um, and they also specifically, the New York stat proposed statute, for example, says that uh, smart contracts may exist in commerce. A contract relating to a transaction may not be denied legal effect, validity, or enforceability solely because that contract contains a smart contract term. There are other parts of the of the statute that are also interesting, and I think it will evolve because the, the, the legislators legislators who are writing this might not fully understand the technology in ways that the the language they uses they use may may impact. But there are several states out there doing this already, so I think. It's something to keep an eye on uh, as we um, get into different applications. Uh, you know, there there will be opportunities to structure your transactions and your smart contracts based on the evolution of the law up to that point. Uh, you, you know, the other issue there there are also back end issues to think about in terms of the, these contracts and the way you write them. Um, and, and how they get affected and rolled out. Things like violations of the security laws, uh, the Dapper in the Dapper Labs case, it's that uh, Lou was discussing earlier, and, and uh, Natasha. It's a class, act, class action lawsuit over the Top Shot moments that is basically seeking rescissory damages um, based on securities law violations. So they're basically seeking to get all the money back and undo the transaction. Same type of thing could happen with various consumer protection. Uh, uh, consumer protection laws in, in various states, particularly where an NFT offering is being made to, to the general public. Uh, so again, there are no cases yet specifically applying those types of statutes to NFTs, but I do believe we're gonna see them, we're gonna start seeing them soon um, as NFTs start getting used in different ways. In, in the sports and entertainment industry, I think we will see examples of that uh, that go beyond collectibles, as I said. So. You could one could envision uh, a, a season ticket holders season ticket account being embodied in an NFT for a season, or uh, the, the purchase of a of a personal seat license or other sort of ongoing right to buy tickets to to at a venue or to concerts being embodied in a, in an NFT in a way that makes it easy to transfer and to sell later on on the secondary market, but is also easy to track, uh, is very efficient and very very secure. Um, other things that we see in the industry, uh, there are things called fan tokens that are a little different than um, than NFTs, but could be incorporated into NFTs. Uh, they, they involve tokens that give the token holders rights to, for example, to vote on certain things that a team or business may decide to do. One, one example is um, the soccer club Juventus. 
uh, had a, an issue where they were they, they allowed their token holders and only the token holders to vote for the design of their new bus, for example. So uh, you have the sports properties looking for new and different ways to engage with and interact with with fans, and the NFT and this technology you know, presents an opportunity. Um, another example may be sports betting. Um, you know, there's a concept concept in smart contracts where sometimes if they if if the smart contract needs to look at something external, uh, that in order to trigger one of its parameters, um, the, the, that external source is called an oracle. Uh, we might I, I can imagine seeing these these types of uh, NFTs being deployed in the sports betting universe, universe where, you know, there is sports betting data that is easily verifiable. Um, and, to, and could be used as a, an oracle to uh, affect uh, the, the, the algorithm in a particular NFT. Um, and I think we're also going to see, and we are seeing already, individual players uh, and entertainers getting very interested in looking for ways to capitalize on uh, NFTs in the context of the rights that they may retain relative to their league or their team or their record company or their publisher, trying to find where, where's that sliver of rights that I can can operate in a way that is going to allow me, the player or the entertainer, to interact directly and engage with my fans in new ways. Um, some of these include off-chain benefits like, you know, lifetime tickets to shows or um, a private listening party hosted by the band or a player or watching something online. There's lots of examples like that that we can that we can expect to see. So, um, I think the uh, uh, basically going to my takeaway slide before I hand this off uh, to Eric. Um, this is what, how I think we're going to see smart contracts, which is one part of the NFT uh, landscape here, uh, start to evolve based on reactions from from lawsuits, from the judiciary, and from legislatures that you know try to, to make this uh, concept evolve in a way that actually works for a broader set of transactions um, in the bigger world. Uh, so, that said, I'm trying to stay on schedule here. I'm going to turn this over to um, uh, Foley partner Eric Sofer, who is a uh, patent lawyer and member of our uh, electronics practice, uh, a resident in our DC office. Uh, Eric, over to you. Terrific. Uh, thank you, Andy. Uh, I'm going to I'm going to leave up the the uh, whether everyone can see me. Uh, I want to leave up the key takeaways while uh, while we're talking here. Uh, once again, I'm Eric Sofer, partner in the DC office, and and I spend my time focusing on patent counseling. And you know, when, it, when an interesting technology arises, we look at how we could gain a competitive advantage from it. Uh, patents are a great tool to lock up a technology, get a monopoly, even before you build your system or even build a prototype. Uh, and as this industry builds. You can put yourself in a position where you have the right to exclude others from using your idea for the next 20 years or so. Lily and Natasha were speaking about how the regulatory framework is unsettled. There are no standards yet, or really even a lot of best practices. Uh, it's wide open for established companies that focus on blockchain-based technology and for others uh, who are new to NFTs to, to innovate a solution to a problem. Perhaps you solved an identified problem, or part of your innovation was identifying a problem that others weren't even aware of yet. So where do we start with looking for what to protect? We probably want to focus on the solutions to those problems plaguing each industry. Those can be problems where the NFT is the solution. Alternatively, the NFT framework may need the innovative solution for widespread adoption, ease of use, security, or, or some other concern. We've seen innovations involving the displays of NFTs, tracking provenance, uh, and new minting techniques. Uh, Andy was discussing smart contracts. Uh, those are full of patenting opportunities. Just a quick note as a follow-up, by the way, uh, when, we, when we talk about patenting, we aren't disclosing any of the code. Uh, none of that underlying code needs to be submitted uh, in a patent application. Uh, in fact, we don't even need to have code or, or even have it uh, uh, built yet. We could just do this based on based on your idea. Now, the basic smart contract structure been around for years, probably not protectable anymore in its current form. But the various triggers and actions in a smart contract, particularly as a computer, automatically causes an action to be taken 
are particularly interesting from a pattern perspective. One question we sometimes hear is whether you can patent an NFT for a different type of media. Instead of art or a photo, maybe it's social networking message or, or some sort of video. Uh, an NFT with a particular underlying media may be patentable. Perhaps the innovation is based on how the NFT is tied to the underlying object. Perhaps the innovation involves the mint data. Uh, we want to consider how the NFT is used. Perhaps it's within a video game or, or within commerce. Uh, and you mentioned uh, Juventus. Uh, the innovation could be a voting system based on NFTs. It, it's all on the table right now. There are innovations coming from all directions, besides artwork and photos, going to the music industry, collectibles, tickets, and even sneakers. Uh, some innovations seem to, to solve a problem using NFTs. Others may be looking to ride that wave of innovation. For those that think NFT is kind of a, a bubble, while there are a few enemies also looking to protect NFTs where maybe there isn't really a compelling need. Sometimes a conventional blockchain approach is sufficient, and the added NFT functionality, maybe it's just extraneous. In the plant community, one hot topic is the collaboration of IBM and an entity called IPWE to create an NFT-based system for tracking complex licensing arrangements. It's not really necessary for just tracking ownership or simple licenses. This is done by the Patent Office's Assignment Database or other contract management software. But if you have more complex arrangements uh, useful in cross licenses or, or patents licenses to different entities with different fields of use, uh, then it could be more interesting. Perhaps you license a family of patents to company A for one field of use and company B for only the US patents and another field of use then a sub-licensee uh, of company A can better understand their rights through this platform. Or maybe you then want to license it to company C, and this system will help you let you know what's been licensed or, or where there might be uh, additional room for, for licensing uh, as it tries to tie each clause or, or each uh, aspect of the license uh, to an NFT. Uh, it's interesting. It's an interesting application for sure, uh, but I think the usefulness really depends on your particular contract management needs. Because there's so much white space for innovation, there's a mad rush to the patent office. It's kind of like the Wild West. Uh, innovators are eager to capture as much protection as possible. Because the patent office, at least in the U.S., has a first-to-file system, there's some incentive to get your patent application filed before someone with a similar idea. If two people independently come up with the same idea, the later filed application is probably going to be precluded from protection. The patent office often, often encounters new technologies. Uh, you know, the fact that NFTs are new uh, to them uh, for, for hundreds of, a couple hundred years, the patent office has been dealing with new technologies as they arise. But in some ways, they aren't really ready for it. The patent office is organized by technology area. And there aren't really any examiners with NFT expertise, at, I'm assuming. Uh, when there was a ramp up in blockchain-related technologies, uh, the applications were distributed to various groups around the patent office. Some went to software, some went to business methods, and then others. Uh, some examiners were actually quite savvy, but others didn't really have the basic understanding of how blockchain works. It could affect patent quality as examiners are learning more about the technology, but, but it's up to us to educate them as well. It usually takes critical mass of submissions, you know, enough applications being filed that they see more of it, uh, some prior art to build up. And, and, of course, with NFTs, there's plenty of articles out there and lots of press these days. Uh, and then also the training of, of the examiners, both internally within the patent office and, and by the applicants. There are a few hurdles for patent protection, but two are really noteworthy. The first is patent eligibility, what we refer to as Section 101. And people associate that with business methods, but it's really an issue for all software inventions and, and others. Essentially, patent eligibility is a threshold for, for patenting when the idea has been around for a while and it's now being tied to uh, a new technology, such as taking a conventional method and now putting it on a website. Uh, or it could be an idea that, that's being done by a computer because a computer is more efficient than a human. Uh, but in reality, the invention doesn't really need a computer. 
we know that the computer is more efficient in calculations and it's meant to store files and transmit files and receive files and do some data manipulation. Uh, but we're looking at what the, what the computer is doing beyond that that ties that, that process uh, to the computer environment. There are some compelling arguments that NFT innovations are more than just an application of, of a new technology, can't be done without a computer. But to be a devil's advocate, let's consider a basic NFT transaction on a blockchain. Uh, an entity mints an NFT and transfers ownership to another entity. As blockchain use has become more widespread, uh, will this technology, including the exchange of ownership, uh, be considered generic, the way conventional databases are? Maybe one day. If so, we may raise the bar for what a particular innovation does beyond that typical blockchain functionality. So as we prepare patent applications, we consider other aspects that are, that are more forward-thinking uh, and proactive approaches to those types of concerns. The other issue to consider is prior art. And uh, this is what we refer to as sections 102 and 103 uh, in the patent world. Uh, who's done this before? And is it really just an obvious variation of, of what's been done before? There isn't really a trove of, of prior art right now other than a lot of those articles uh, that, that we've seen. And to the extent that similar functionality has been offered before, it probably doesn't use the terminology non-fungible token. Uh, it may say something like cryptographic digital asset. Uh, we saw the same thing with artificial intelligence as well. Artificial intelligence has uh, been very popular lately in the last few years, uh, and examiners are getting up to speed, though a few years ago, uh, there weren't as many applications that, that characterized it as, as artificial intelligence or machine learning. There were other terms that they used for it, uh, and we're dealing with a similar situation uh, with, with NFTs and, and the terminology here. Now, it may be a bit early to have the benefit of a patentability search because there just isn't a lot out there yet. Uh, we usually look at prior art, articles, patent applications, uh, uh, just like the examiners are going to do when they examine a patent application. Uh, but we need to consider those alternate ways of characterizing uh, the technology. And it's going to require someone who can uh, not just perform a keyword search and find synonyms, but really understand the underlying technology to, to make sure it's, it's an equivalent to uh, uh, what, the, what the NFT uh, platform is proposing. Uh, so just like some basic internet searching, uh, a, a keyword search may not be as productive. So we know that there's innovation in lots of aspects of this technology. Uh, will it be patentable? Some of it, for sure, it definitely will be. Other innovations? Yeah, when they fall in the gray area, maybe. Uh, but, but this is such a pioneering technology right now, the best practice is probably just go for it. Uh, uh, see what kind, of, what kind of land grab you can, you can make and uh, uh, worry later about, uh, um, about the scope and what others have been, uh, have been protecting as well. A tremendous amount of opportunities out there right now, though. Uh, now, patents are just a uh, just component of a comp comprehensive IP strategy. So let's turn it over to Laura Ganoza to hear about some other IP considerations. Thank you so much, Eric. Hello, everybody. I'm Laura Ganoza, and I'm resident at the firm's Miami office, where I am the chair of the litigation department, and I focus on IP litigation, trademarks, and copyrights. And I also head the firm's fashion apparel and beauty group. And I'm a member of the uh, NFT task force. And um, as a person who focuses uh, a lot on IP litigation, I was really interested and I'm following with great interest the what I think is the first NFT lawsuit involving IP rights. And that's the case involving Rockefeller Records versus Damon Dash. So um, for those of you who aren't aware of it, it's, uh, it, it all basically revolves around the 1996 album, iconic album, I should say, of Jay-Z called Reasonable Doubt. And uh, Rockefeller Records, Inc. is the owner of all the copyrights to that album. And Rockefeller, the company, has three shareholders. Each of them have uh, one third interest in the company, and one of those shareholders is Damon Dash. And uh, in June, June 18th 
of 2021, uh, Rockefeller sued Damon Dash to stop an NFT that Damon Dash was uh, planning on selling. And it's really important to see what the press release that was talking about the NFT actually said. And this goes back to some of the comments that Andy was making in terms of, you know, the description of the NFT is not necessarily going to be found in the code that's not really readable, but instead in just the uh, language describing what it is. And the NFT was actually described, and I have it here in the in the PowerPoint so you can see the actual language. It's the auction of Damon's ownership of the copyright to Jay-Z's first album, Reasonable Doubt, entitling the new owner to future revenue generated by the unique asset. And there was additional um, statements made in this press release that this was a groundbreaking and landmark uh, sale of the copyright to Jay-Z's Reasonable Doubt as an NFT. And the newly minted NFT will provide ownership of the album's copyright, transferring the rights to all future revenue generated by the album from Damon Dash to the auction winner. Well, that set off alarm bells, and Rockefeller sued Damon Dash to stop the sale, and and they ended up getting a temporary injunction. And in fact, there's a hearing tomorrow to determine if that's going to be converted to a preliminary injunction. Uh, and I've been keeping up with the docket, which reads a little bit like a soap opera. And it, it may be the case that this is not an IP case after all. Damon Dash is arguing that, oh, no, no, this was a mistake. I was not ever planning to sell the copyright to the album. I recognize I don't own that. I was just trying to sell my one-third interest in the, in the company, and you can't stop me from selling my shares in Rockefeller Records. So ultimately, um, we're going to see how this all shakes out with the court and uh, what the court does about that, whether this is really an IP case or not. But I do think that it really, um, it regardless of what happens with this case, it does have a lot of implications and brings to mind some things that people should be thinking about when thinking about the NFT space and IP in general. And the first key takeaway is that, you know, NFTs, they're here to stay, at least for now. And people are looking at this as a way to cash in, as Andy was saying as well, you know, trying to change the way that um, something that may already be out there, try to monetize it in a different way. So NFTs are here to stay because who's to say if Damon Dash wanted to sell either the copyrights or even just his shares in the company about a year and a half ago, is this the way he would have done it? Or is it just now that 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 this is the, the new uh, trend for um, trying to generate um, income in this way. So just starting with that, NFTs are here. People are going to find ways to use them. But until the law catches up or until there's legislation or until there's court cases that test it, you still have to keep in mind the traditional notions of contract law, property law, trademark law, copyright, all the kinds of laws that you would typically um, apply, you still have to apply them in this space until maybe there is legislation like the type that we've been discussing uh, that may be coming down in New York and then maybe other courts will follow, uh, other states will follow suit or in the Dapper Lab case, maybe if we get some kinds of ruling from the court as to what what is or is not a security in the NFT realm. But in the meantime, uh, thinking about what you should think about is step back and think about this in the traditional ways. And the most important thing, especially if you're a creator and you're putting something out there, is what are you selling as an NFT? Uh, because that's going to be key. And as you can see with ha what happened in this case, the, re the reason there's even a lawsuit, I guess, is because the way the NFT was described was that it was selling the copyright to this album. And if that's the case, let's assume let's assume if there hadn't been a lawsuit and the sale had gone forward, what would that buyer have really gotten if it was promoted one way, but then you're sold a different thing? You know, those traditional notions of contract law are still going to apply. 
And so think about, as a creator, you have to think about first, okay, what it is, what is it that we're actually selling? And then promote it in that way. And then secondly, if you're thinking about what you're selling, you have to think about all the rights that surround what you're selling. Who is the owner of those rights? Are you, are you the creator, the exclusive owner? Are there other owners or are there um, limits? Are there licensing agreements in place that prevent certain um, things from happening? I mean, all those kinds of things are things that you need to look into, just as you would be doing if you sell, if you were just selling something else in a more tangible fashion. So just because it's in an NFT doesn't mean that you uh, throw away all the notions of the law that exists. Now, that doesn't mean you can't test them. And there may be cases where, yes, indeed, there is a contract already in place, but it does not apply to this set of scenarios. And uh, you can, um, you know, you can change, change that up. And it may actually uh, cause reason to review certain contracts, review certain licensing agreements to see if hey, now this, there's this new technology out there. Are the agreements that we have in place sufficiently um, um, worded to cover these kinds of uh, this new technology and these potential new ways to monetize whatever the underlying art or work or um, IP there is that you may be trying to sell? So that's very important to do before you launch any kind of NFT is to think about all of those things. And also, if you are on the other side and you want to enforce against someone using NFTs, again, uh, merely because something's an NFT doesn't mean it, it automatically loses certain rights. So you have to check to see, okay, is this something I can enforce against? Are there going to be First Amendment considerations for a piece of art, for example? Are there going to be um, freedom of expression, fair use examples? If somebody takes uh, something that uh, maybe a brand owns but changes it in a way uh, that uh, creates a, a, new, um, a new piece of work and uh, to the principles of um, fair use and First Amendment free expression rights, those may trump what the ultimate item is that's being sold. So the key takeaway, I think, is that, as I think all of us have said in this webinar today, is that this still is really an evolving area of the law and um, you have to uh, take with it uh, the fact that, you know, the law is going to have to evolve with it. The courts are going to have to evolve with it. And we're just going to have to keep the discussion going, keep seeing how these um, matters continue to develop. And uh, part of that is what we're doing here today in that um, we have two people that are in the industry who are going to keep that conversation going. So um, with that, I'm going to hand it back over to my partner, uh, uh, Sean Israel, who is going to introduce our panelists, and they're going to talk about uh, their own experience in this space. So John, take it from here. <laughs> Great. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. And thanks uh, to the rest of the members here of the, the Foley NFT task force for cutting through just some of the relevant legal issues and developments in the NFT space today. Uh, really appreciated hearing all of that. But as Laura said, let's now pivot to our special guests who are going to share their insights and experiences with NFTs and help us consider those legal issues in a practical and, and real context. And as I mentioned earlier, with us today is Tamara Daniels. Tamara is an experienced lawyer who's currently the senior vice president and general counsel with the Charlotte Hornets, one of the first NBA teams to mint an NFT. And before that, Tamara was the vice president and general counsel of the NHL's Vegas Golden Knights. Um, and joining Tamara is A.J. Vaynerchuk, an entrepreneur and investor who has guided various self-titled businesses, including Vayner Sports, an athlete representation firm, Vayner RSE, a fund focused on investing 
working in and building tomorrow's companies and Vayner Media, a social first digital agency. And AJ is actively involved in the NFT space. In fact, I saw the other day he tweeted out that he just required a physical NFT of Emmanuel Quickly of the New York Knicks. So maybe we'll hear a little bit about what a physical NFT is um, in this presumably digital world that we are operating in. But uh, facilitating this conversation with our two guests are two of my Foley colleagues, Andy Lee, whom you already met, who I'm going to spare a further introduction. And I also want to introduce Catherine Zhu, who's in our Silicon Valley office. And Catherine's an experienced uh, commercial and privacy lawyer whose practice is focused on complex commercial agreements, licensing transactions, data sharing transactions, business expansion, and data privacy. She, too, has experience with NFT projects, including recently uh, work for the uh, Milwaukee Bucks and its NFT drop memorabilia from their 1970s championship season. So I'm going to kick it over to Catherine, and, and let's hear from our guests. Thank you, John. Great to be here to get today. And thank you, everyone in the audience, for taking time out of your day to join our discussion. Um, Tamara and AJ, really excited to have you both here. Thank you for taking the time. Uh, and yeah, and as uh, I, I think I'll, I was going to do intros, but I think I'll spare them as well, because John did such a great job right before this for everybody. And we can jump right into the discussion. Uh, so Tamara, um, as John mentioned, I know you, as the Hornets, you were one of the front runners in, you know, being one of the first professional sports teams and getting into the NFT launch. Uh, the NFT that you launched was really successful, very fan friendly. Can you tell us a little bit more about how that came together and just your experience um, going through that? I think, Tamara, you're on mute. We can't hear you. Okay, well, why don't we, um, I think uh, Jenny's working on that for, for Tamara. Let's let her interrupt as soon as she gets the audio going. But AJ, in the meantime, um, similar question for you. You. Uh, uh, you guys recently did the, the V Friends uh, launch with your your brother Gary. Uh, as I understand it, it's one of the most actively traded NFTs um, out there. Can you talk a little bit about what that process was? And Tamara, speak up if you feel like it, just interrupt if you get your volume back. But go ahead, HA. Sure thing. Do you guys hear me? Yes. Awesome. Cool. Um, so yeah, as you mentioned, um, my brother Gary. I helped him launch a project called V Friends. It's um, it's an interesting NFT project from this perspective of it is an example of creating intellectual property from NFTs as opposed to um, the other way around, right? So NBA Top Shot and what Tamara did with the Charlotte Hornets is a great example of taking an existing IP that has affinity and bringing it into the NFT landscape. What my brother and I are trying to do is actually flip that funnel and go the other way where we want to build intellectual property that's long standing for decades to come, but the origination of that intellectual property is done via NFT. And so that project features uh, roughly 250 um, hand drawn characters that my brother actually physically drew himself and then we digitized them. And it's structured in a collectibles format. Um, it's a little bit of a hybrid of Pokemon and sports cards, I think is the easiest way to describe it in the sense that. Pokemon because it's fictional characters, but sports cards because there is some of that similar parallel in terms of, for one of the characters, for example, uh, Patient Panda is one of the characters of V Friends. And for Patient Panda, there are 20 core tokens that are all white background and basic and simple. But then from there, 
there's actually eight rare tokens with a brown background, five very rare tokens with an orange background, two green tokens that are called epics, and then um, there's individual one of ones called spectacular. So one of them has a holographic background, one has a bubblegum type background, and so there is this rarity and scarcity component to it. And um, you know, we launched it about six weeks ago. It's done. Uh, it's done very well. Uh, Andy, to your point, it's uh, one of the most actively traded collectibles in the space. I'm looking at the last 30 days, there's been about $10 million worth of secondary sales um, for that, which ranks it in the top seven of all NFT projects, along with things like NBA Top Shot, which I mentioned, and, and CryptoPunks being another uh, popular NFT project. That's interesting. Where, where are you tracking that it's like compared to other? Yeah, yeah you can see it. Um, there's a great website called Crypto Slam. It's CryptoSlam.io, and what they do is they give you the 24-hour, the seven-day, the 30-day, and the all-time sales by volume, and this all tracks secondary sales. So, for example, when we first dropped the project and sold um, the vFriends direct-to-consumer, those transactions did not count towards CryptoSlam's uh, accounting. They're only tracking consumer-to-consumer -consumer secondary market sales. Got it. As T Tam, are you with us now? I mean, I've been here. Can you Good. hear me? Yes, we got you now. I just want everyone to know that I, I do understand how to unmute, and uh, I was not <laughs> unmute. So please don't uh, have that reflect negatively on my skill set here. <laughs> yeah. Well, awesome. I'm so glad you got your audio back. And um, I don't want to cut you off, AJ or uh, Andy. Mm -hmm. So, um, why don't we finish that seg segment and then we can kind of go back to the first no, question. We had why don't we, yeah, let, let, let Tamara go back to what she was uh, talking about there. Um, I think the question was a broad overview maybe of our NFT project. And so um, at the Hornets, I oversee um, strategy and innovation. Um, as part of that, it, I oversee certain projects like our NFT project. I also oversee our 2K team, which is our um, NBA 2K esports team uh, called the Venom. And uh, we're mid-season right now uh, for the Venom. But so we, um, as part of a leadership meeting, we um, started talking about the topic of NFTs and we kind of just decided that we wanted to get into the space. And so um, I took the lead on the project and the way we started was just to uh, put together a group of stakeholders who are interested, um, everyone from the leadership team to um, people in you know all different departments, anybody who had any interest in the space whatsoever. And we kind of put together a brainstorm group. And we um, had a one hour meeting for each Monday of four Mondays to try to hone in on exactly what we wanted to do in the space and how we thought it would work and so we ultimately uh, landed on wanting to do a um, digital ticket because we thought it was the most um, fan friendly because there's a little bit of education that goes into the space I think as you guys heard um, throughout today's um, presentation that you know blockchain technology has a lot of different iterations everything from cryptocurrency to coins to tokens and then within tokens there's um, a whole lot of other um, subsets like whether it's a social social token whether it's a utility token whether it's a security token um all of those things and so we wanted to do something that our average fan could understand and could afford to get into um and so we ultimately decided that a um digital ticket was the way to go for now so we have launched three which are part of a series um to be continued into next season and the idea is that at the end of the series, those individuals who have collected all in the series will be entitled to a unique experience, uh, which we have not announced yet. Well, that's very exciting and very innovative. And I will say it's a bit of a dis different from some of the other team NFTs that have launched. They haven't taken necessarily a very, you know, uh, easy or uh, you know, large volume approach, right? They might sell one or two, but you guys have really um, prioritized the fans, which is very, very exciting. Um, in terms of carrying this out, Tamara, what role did kind of the, you guys play as a team? 
the players and then the league was there you know did, did different stakeholders play different roles or was it more of a united effort so the players were not involved because obviously the league and the players association and the players themselves have rights to the players likeness as well as game moments. Um, so we were limited to what the team entity owns from an IP perspective, which is our name, logos. Um, and that's how we landed on the digital ticket. So our NFT um, is, uh, there's an unboxing element, which is an exploding hive. And then the ticket lives with inside that exploding hive. And so we released this at um, the fan appreciation game, which was the last regular season home game in our season against the Clippers. And um, then the second one was for the first play in round. Um, and then the third one was actually for the Venom, which is our 2K team. Um, and so we, we really approached the project from the business um, standpoint. So it was um, the business stakeholders from ticketing, sponsorship, marketing, um, business intelligence, um, those types of groups. Awesome. Uh, yeah, that's, go ahead. No, well, leading off of that, it, you know, you're talking about the sort of splitting off with the players. I'm curious uh, whether either of you, or AJ, maybe you have some insight into this, uh, you know, what you're doing with Gary, right? In a sense, Gary is a talent, but he's also, you know, the, the business. And, um, but you guys interact with athletes and, and, you know, represent athletes as well. What, what are your, what are you seeing or what do you expect to see on the, on, on the talent side meaning you know the athletes or the actual entertainers in terms of um how they want to use nfts sure um so yeah tamra highlighted that you know when it comes to the intellectual property and the opportunity with nft when it comes to the league the teams and players it is a bit fragmented everybody has what they have ownership over and the players have the union in most sports um what you've seen so far is a, a mixed bag um nba top shot brought it up once and i'll bring it up again is a good example where the league and the players together uh, built a property in connection with dapper labs on the flow blockchain that has had some good success very good success then you've had a group of players attempt to do it on their own um i think patrick mahomes and rob gronkowski are two football players that launched nfts towards the peak of um, the initial NFT madness in the spring. You then had other athletes like Damian Lillard and Bryson DeChambeau and, and, and Francis Ngannou and a few others do it. Um, it's been mixed results. I think the mixed results stem from the fact that the, the athlete NFT so far um, didn't necessarily have a long-term strategy to engage consumers. So for example, Tamara mentioned they already have plans for next year. And based on purchasing the first NFT or the second NFT or all the NFTs, it creates experiences. Whereas some of the player NFTs so far kind of sit in a silo and stand alone and, and kind of uh, float in the ether. And so I don't think they have had tremendous amounts of success in that regard. But I think it's, it's mainly, it's not due to the opportunity not being there. I just think that... Um, there hasn't been a breakthrough project yet from an athlete or from talent that brings real utility and a real ecosystem to, and really utilizes the power of the NFT, right? And so obviously I'm biased, but I think my brother is a great example of somebody that, listen, my brother's not a famous musician or a famous athlete, but he does have a large audience. He does have a large platform. And I think his unique approach of building an ecosystem centered around the community that he's built um, you know, one thing I glossed over is there is quite a bit of tangible real world access associated with a lot of the NFTs. So for example, there was 10,255 tokens that we sold. Each one of those can serve as a ticket to something called VCon, which is an annual conference. And so um, when you buy the NFT, you get this ticket that has a monetary value and, and access to an event where you can network with like-minded individuals. And my brother will obviously be there and there'll be guest speakers and the whole nine. And so I just think um, it's still very early. You know, it's extremely early and I'm excited by the opportunities. And I guess I'll, I'll summarize by saying that I think as far as talent goes, it's been a mixed bag so far, but some good experimentation. Yeah, well, I think that uh, gives us a really well-rounded 
perspective, right, from both um, Tamara as well as you, AJ, in terms of, you know, how people are thinking about these NFTs and what they're doing with them. Um, in terms of the potential, I know AJ touched upon this just now, the potential of these NFTs to kind of, you know, sh reshape how people interact with their sports team, how athletes can monetize their likeness or other ways, other innovative ways that weren't previously there for engagement or revenue production. Um, what what do you what do you guys see? You know, potential on the horizon. And I know some of that has already materialized um, based on what you've done, AJ, as well as Tamara, when you talked about the Hornets NFT launch. But do you see kind of other opportunities on the horizon? Um, maybe Tamara to you first, and then AJ back to you. Sure. Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, and, and you summarized it well, you know, our approach was not a monetization approach. It was a fan engagement um, approach. We wanted to be a food, uh, like a first mover in the space. That was our main goal. Um, I think the NFT itself in terms of the digital collectible might be short lived. I don't really see that being something that has a lot of long term um, impact. But the blockchain and the technology that allows for authentication is huge. And so, yeah, I think that there's a lot of uses um, well beyond the sports world. But in the sports world, I think, you know, ticketing is one example. Um, you guys talked about music licensing. Uh, one of the main challenges in the industry for licensing, obviously, is as between the artist and the label. Um, the rights holders. And if you are somebody who's looking to license music like a sports team, it is a challenge. There's only clearing houses for, you know, in arena use at this time um, for public performance rights. There's not, um, there's not a centralized um, licensor um, for digital and social media use. And so um, I see that being a, a huge opportunity um, for that industry to utilize blockchain technology to do that auth authentication and licensing so that the um, copyright holders are continuing to get their royalties throughout the life of the licensing, um, just like we would with uh, ticket sales on the, on the primary and secondary market um, to, to eliminate those fraudulent sales. And the same thing with collectibles um, for artists and for teams. Yeah, to, to jump in, I think um, for the most part, when people talk about NFTs, the, the majority of the conversation is focused on collectibles as well as art. Um, but I think when you look at the back end of the smart track contract and the power of the blockchain, I think there's just so much utility that goes beyond that. Um, I think loyalty programs will be um, in a much better place due to blockchain. I think that's going to be important. I think the ease of being able to centralize everything under one quote unquote wallet. Um, now that may be tricky if some things are on flow and other things are on Ethereum, et cetera. But I do think you'll see cross wrapping across blockchains and eventually the centralization of blockchains being able to talk to one another. And so I think customer data loyalty programs will be important. Uh, Tamara mentioned ticketing. I think ticketing for concerts and sporting events, um, that'll be an important aspect of this. I've seen people dabbling with the idea of homes and the deeds to a home being tied to the blockchain. Um, there was a well-known tech writer, Michael Arrington, who sold an apartment overseas via NFT, for example. So, um, you know, like anything, I think that there, there was a ton of buzz just a few months ago. There's still a ton of buzz. There's a lot of money and, and brands coming in and playing in the playground. But Again, I said it earlier, I just think it's so early. I, I equate to the NFT landscape right now to the dot-com era in the mid-90s, right? Websites have come a long way in the last 10 to 20 years, and I think um, we're going to see the same thing as in regards to Web3, blockchain, and NFTs. Yeah, absolutely. I agree. The market is very hot right now. Um, for the NFTs, we've seen a lot of, you know, mainstream institutional players get get into what used to be kind of more of a fringe uh, technology. So I um, agree with you that there's a lot of potential. What, um, Tamara, uh, has been the reaction in, in your experience coming from kind of the team and the professional sports world who probably 
maybe two years ago, maybe was not very familiar with NFTs and all of a sudden it's become this super popular thing. What's been the general reaction? Has it been positive, negative? Like what, what are people, people saying? Yeah, our fan base overwhelmingly um, was excited about our release and we weren't sure what to expect in a smaller market like Charlotte. Um, but there was a lot of demand um, and our NFTs. So to take a step back, we once we had the idea, we then had to execute it, right? And so we had to figure out how we were going to make it happen. Um, and we, from landing on the idea to the game that we needed to release these for, we had like three weeks. And it was um, every single day was like a new challenge that we had to find a workaround for. Um, and so in the course of just making it happen, we were also trying to make sure that we got the word out enough so that people would be interested in it um, without revealing too much, because to be completely honest, until game day, when we were going to drop the NFT, like we really didn't know if we were going to be ready. Um, mm -hmm. And we owe a lot of thanks to um, the, the programmers at Mint, uh, who is who we use to mint our NFT, but we did everything else in-house. So we um, we designed the um, NFT with the animation using our in-house um, graphics team. Um, we sold the NFT through our app, through our arena app um, that we just, we worked with our app provider and um, our f &B provider basically to use their POS so that we could run it through that way. There was a huge manual component because at the time, um, Mint hadn't yet been integrated with an online storefront. Um, so that's why we did it that way. Um, and we wanted to drop it in game so that we could get, generate the interest and the buzz because there would be a lot of eyes on on the drop. And so um, we we found that people were really, really excited about it. We only released um, 88 in the first edition, and that was a callback to our inaugural season in 1988. Um, and so they sold out in minutes. Um, we did the second drop and they sold out in seconds. Um, and then the third drop for the um, Venom was a lot less successful in that th they didn't sell through as quickly. Um, and I think that is attributed to the fact that there wasn't like an, there was no um, active event going on. I mean, there was, there was a game, um, but you know, 2K you view on Twitch um, and so the broadcast through Twitch is a whole different um, crowd. And we were actually interested to see that because we thought for sure that the fan base for the 2K team would be a lot more educated and a lot more interested. And um, actually, I thought our design for that NFT was the best one. Um, so I, you know, not that buyers see it before it drops, but I just was excited about that one. And so it was interesting to see how that ultimately played out. But um I'd say the reaction was was really um, positive. It's great. It's, I, I love how it kind of doesn't go where you think it's going to go. Um, mm -hmm. But all three of those sound like really great drops. Hey, Catherine, can I to jump in? I, I want to say we, we have a question actually from one of the from the audience. And I would like to point out to everyone in the audience, if you have questions, put them in. If we don't get to them, we will respond to you off chain. But I thought this was worth bringing up to AJ and Tamara. The question uh, is, what are your thoughts with uh, about NFTs in the fantasy sports world? Have you had any discussions or given any thought to it or heard anything about it? Yeah, I can jump yeah, in. Yeah, I mean, um, go ahead, AJ, okay. yeah. Okay, I'll be super brief. Um, you know, I think it's, a, it's very interesting. Um, I think the blockchain especially allows for kind of multi-year, more like dynasty keeper league aspects to be very positive. There's a company called So Rare, um, which is a soccer fantasy platform where it basically mixes the hybrid of collecting NFTs with fantasy sports. So, for example, if you own a Mbappe NFT, that NFT serves as like a bonus to your counting stats, right? And so I'll use American football, for example. If you own a Patrick Mahomes NFT, you could have it be like a bonus where for – you know, all the yards Mahomes uh, throws for, if you own the Mahomes NFT, you get 5% more yards, which means you get 5% more points. So, so rare is something I would recommend. So rare.com. Uh, my brother's actually an angel investor in that one. And I think that's a really interesting exercise in the intersection of fantasy and NFTs. 
Yeah, I would just second that. I, I, I think that is a huge opportunity and um, the interactive nature of it is going to be where the focus ends up going, just in my opinion, um, but sort of kind of the same way where you see some of the tokens um, are collectible for users completing micro tasks and other types of gamification um, applications. So I, I do think that AJ is exactly right. That's that's going to be a, a really big um, opportunity to watch out for. Have you guys given any thought to uh, the the role of NFTs, or really whether NFTs will shepherd in a little more activity in the in the sports and entertainment world in in kind of the virtual virtual world? A lot of a lot of people who have been active in the crypto space uh, since before we all started, you know, hearing about NFTs in the last several months, um, have real you know lives and and own properties and put on shows and art galleries in virtual spaces like crypto voxels where you know nfts can you know be used for things like mortgaging a virtual space or tickets to a virtual event I i'm curious whether you guys uh have any thoughts about that as well Tamara, go ahead yeah i i do think that that will also be um an iteration of it I thought, honestly, it would be more like I was mentioning with our 2K team. It's interesting. I mean, esports is a whole other topic, but it's really interesting, the dynamic, because obviously we're still trying to hone in who exactly are, are the 2K um, fans. And for those of you who don't know, the NBA has a video game called NBA 2K. Um, about 10 teams in the NBA also have 2K franchises associated with them. Um, there's actual real, we have six human players, um, a coach, a GM, a scout, um, an analytics person. So it's a full staff organization and, and it's a different fan base. And so I really thought that the, that fan base would be particularly interested um, in, in the NFT launch. And maybe they are, um, but it might be in a different way. They may not be interested in the digital ticket. And so I think kind of, you know, what you're saying is is a good point, which is, maybe it's more of an interactive um, NFT for some kind of virtual experience. Um, there's definitely some other um, VR uh, experiences that are maybe going to be associated there. Um, and I think that's probably, I probably am not going to get into much because it's a whole other uh, area, but um, yeah, AJ, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I think um, I think the opportunity is there. I think um, if I'm being honest, I thought we'd be even further along today than we are. If you had a, if you asked me that same question five years ago, I probably would have overshot it um, and overstated how much I think people would have participated. Um, but I think you've seen, particularly in video games, I think a great example was uh, Fortnite did a concert with Travis Scott maybe a year ago and got absurd attendance. And so I think maybe as the younger generation ushers in, um, it'll it'll scale even faster. So it's there, I played around with it. I think maybe for a certain demographic, it's not the most intuitive uh, to get in there. Um, but I think for a younger generation, especially you call it the, the, the young gamer, I think it'll accelerate the whole idea of participation in virtual events and virtual worlds. Yeah, it's it's really exciting, and I I know the concert you're talking about it was kind of mind blowing, right? How how engaging it was, yeah. not being a live concert. So um, definitely very very exciting uh, uh, times that we live in. Um, so I know we, I believe um, we might have time for one more topic, uh, and then we might have to bring it to close. Um, so in terms of, I know we had to touch upon this a little bit earlier, but um, I know we focused a lot on the potential of the NFTs, like how engaging they can be, how they can create new revenue streams. Um, on the flip side, do you guys see any potential pitfalls with NFTs, anything to be aware of uh, when you're kind of dealing in this space? Yeah. 
I'll jump in quickly. Um, from a consumer perspective, yes, there's just a very high barrier to entry. It's not the most intuitive. It's not the easiest. Um, something that we've seen on my brother's project, unfortunately, is that um, new consumers to blockchain and tech and this type of tech have fallen um, into some traps um, and scams. Um, so one thing I'll throw out there is if you ever sign up for a MetaMask account, for example, which is a popular wallet for Ethereum in particular, um, never share your phrase. There's a seed phrase or a recovery phrase. Never share that phrase because that enables anybody to get into your wallet and act as you. So, you know, definitely be on the watch out for, you know, random messages on, you know, Discord is a very popular place to hang out and talk about NFTs. And a lot of NFT projects are on Discord. And if you get a random message and it sounds too good to be true, it's probably too good to be true. So that's one thing I'll highlight is, you know, with the early crypto consumer, these are some of the smartest people in the world. And unfortunately, there's a small segment that are not necessarily the nicest people in the world. So there is the, the challenge and the danger of that. And then also just be really careful when you're transferring your, your assets. And, you know, one wrong keystroke can mean you send your NFT into outer space and it's never found again, right? Make sure you keep your seed phrase because if MetaMask asks you to enter it and you're unable to enter it, you'll never access your NFT again. So from a technical perspective and user experience perspective, I think that's worth calling out. Yeah, I think that's right from the consumer perspective. And you guys already covered all the legal issues that which are broad. But um, I think if you are an organization looking to create an NFT, you you need to kind of decide why you're creating it and what your goal is. And then from there back into how you're going to do it. Um, you want to make a decision early on as to whether you're going to be on Flow or Ethereum because right now it's difficult to move your NFT from one blockchain to another. Like the user's not gonna be able to do that. You'd have to physically do that for them, um, which would be a really large undertaking depending on what you're doing. So you have to kind of pick your path and you have to pick what else is available in the platform that you're gonna be using to market and sell your NFT and what the secondary market platform is gonna be because that's where your users are gonna go to look to um, buy, sell, trade, exchange, those kinds of things. And so if you're doing a single site where the only NFTs available in that storefront are yours, just be mindful that your buyers, your users are really gonna only see your NFTs. So you wanna look to see, are there any other storefronts that my NFT storefront can integrate with? What does it look like? What is the user experience? How um, easy or difficult are we looking to make this? And to AJ's point, we um, we made sure that we kept it as simplistic from a consumer perspective as possible. I likened it to no, being no different than buying a hot dog from our mobile ordering app in the arena. It was literally just a tile, a purchase tile on the app that we pushed live at the time we dropped the NFT. You clicked on it, you put in your, um, you know, your credit card information, you purchased your NFT for $4.99, you got a confirmation email. We then pushed um, an email to that person with a link that they clicked on and they very easily just put in their username um, and email address. And so they were creating a crypto wallet without even knowing that they were, um, which was just like a white label set site ultimately that was Hornets branded that you know hosted their NFT. So um, I think all of those things are just considerations if you're looking to get into the space and um, mint an NFT. And then of course, you know, economic considerations of like, what are the costs of gas will impact your decision on which blockchain to go with and um, which vendor and all of that kind of stuff. Yeah, no, all, all great points. It's a very exciting and lots of potential in the field, but also pitfalls to watch out for. So um, proceed with caution obviously um, would apply. Um, well, thank you both so much for that discussion. I think I was, you know, super educational to hear about both of your experiences. John, I'm going to pass it back to you now to um, wrap up our, our webinar today. Thank you. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you both. I mean, that was so interesting. And I know we've gone over the 230 mark. Uh, and I think we could have kept going. Uh, it always feels like we're just scratching the surface, even even with that somewhat of a, a deep dive. So uh, I'm just going to close it out uh, by thanking everyone for joining us today. 
And obviously a special thank you to AJ and Tamara for participating and sharing their experiences and perspectives and, and really just giving us a amazingly interesting discussion. Uh, I wanna thank also the Foley marketing and, and tech personnel who helped us put all this together. Just so you know, if you're on this call and on the program, you will be getting an email um, with a thank you, uh, which will include a link to the, the full presentation. And ultimately, um, this full seminar will be posted you know, on the uh, NFT task force page at, at Foley.com. I was looking at the question box. There was a lot of really interesting um, and thoughtful questions posed that we just didn't get to in the course of this. And as Andy said, we're gonna we're just gonna follow up with those folks, and and uh, we'll look to be in touch with you soon. And I hope we'll be back again with more interesting programming um, as everybody here, you know, watches the developments in in the NFT space. So happy uh, 4th of July and have a great weekend and we'll hopefully be seeing you all soon. Thanks so much, everyone.